Amen. I want to also mention to you to keep uh, our Ukraine project in prayer. We have uh, churches that are signing up to uh, rebuild after the war. And in the meantime, we're still negotiating the 40 tons of medical supplies from the Native American tribe in uh, Canada and uh, the locomotive project where they're trying to extract the uh, um, engines from locomotives that will provide, uh, I think it was 5,000 kilowatts, whatever. It's, it'll, it'll power 10,000 homes. Each one will power 10,000 homes. So uh, because the infrastructure, the power grid's down, we're uh, trying to get these ahead of time to move them by ship over to Ukraine. So as soon as the war ends, we'll have um, temporary power in place. Anyway, keep all that in prayer. That's all is still in the works. All right. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. One of the greatest uh, challenges of believers today is to not compromise. You know, each and every day we have opportunities to compromise. Our culture is changing around us. Our language is changing. Uh, are we going to compromise in what we say, how we say it, how we refer to people, the pronouns that we use? Uh, all of this is compromise. And what we want to look at it from uh, Matthew 4 is the link between temptation and compromise. And I want to explain, explain a few different things on compromise to us. And um, it says, Then Jesus was led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward hungry. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If you be the Son of God, command these stones to be made bread. Compromise begins at our point of personal weakness. That's where compromise begins, our point of personal weakness. If we are the kind of person that wants to be liked by others and we'll do anything to be liked by others or to be accepted, or we are so fearful about losing a job, we will compromise because that's a personal point of weakness. Now, in order to not compromise, one of the things we need to do is shore up those weak spots, find our weak points in our own personalities ahead of time, and find the scripture that builds us up because the word of God says the Holy Spirit builds us up in the inner man to be strong, strengthens us with all might. The word might is power. It's the power that Jesus exhibited when he rose from the dead, the power that seated him at the right hand of the Father. This is resurrection power that's available to every believer to shore up the, the weak points in their lives and turn those weaknesses into strengths. One of the things that we know of, of the scripture is we celebrate reversal. Reversal. You were going in one direction, reversed and went to another. I mean, you know my story. I was living in Israel as an archaeologist. I was doing my own thing. I was into everything. I was as liberal culturally as you could be. And yet I met Jesus because on the inside I was miserable. I was unfulfilled and I was unhappy. And the reference was made by Barbara when, about when I first came to a church, a charismatic church in Jerusalem, how I hated it and how I thought everybody was crazy. But sooner or later, the word made sense to me. I accepted Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior, and I made a reversal. When we are saved, it's a reversal. We leave the kingdom of darkness, we enter the kingdom of heaven. We leave a sinful life, we enter a life of strength. Jesus demonstrated that reversal when he rose from the dead. The dead body came alive. Our faith is in resurrection. Our faith is in resurrection life, a miraculous resurrection, which is a reversal. Now, compromise is the temptation to do something that we can do. Compromise is the temptation to do something we can do, but it's not of God. That's the difference. Compromise is not tempting us to do something that we can't do. It's very simple. It's something we can do. When Peter compromised, it was very easy for him to deny Jesus. That was a compromise. His, he, he was afraid. Why did he compromise? Fear. And that's generally... You talked about fear. That's the bottom line of compromise. We compromise many times out of fear. Fear of ridicule, fear of not fitting in, fear of being ostracized, fear of failure, whatever that fear may be. But anything that's fear-based is not of God. He's not given us the spirit of fear, but of love, of power, there's that word power again, and of a sound mind. The more we compromise, the less sound our mind will be, by the way. That's why people start out with a small compromise and they end up 72 genders later. So it's compromise begins small, but continues and grows just like sin. 
may seem like it's insignificant, but little, little, well, let me, let me do it in terms of archaeology. One of the things I used to do in archaeology was use a theodolite to survey. Why would we do that? Well, we would do it for two reasons, to get elevations so we know what level we're working in. If you're in a tell that has 23 different civilizations, 23 different levels, you need to know on one side of the hill what you're digging in as a, compared to the other side of the hill. And so you would shoot levels so you know if you're on the same level because basically people lived on the level. You know, people like to live on flat areas. So it would be the same layer, the same time period at the same level. But another thing, when we would work in, in uh, Jericho, which was King Herod's palace that I worked on, one of the things, the reasons we would use the, the theodolite is because they always built in straight lines. Nobody built curves or crooked. It was always straight line. So if you found a wall, you could project where that wall was going by shooting a straight line. Now, if I'm the tiniest fraction of a centimeter of an inch off at the point where I'm, I'm shooting the line, by the time I get to the other side of the excavation, I could be three or four feet off. So when I transfer that to my diagram that I'm drawing, it doesn't fit. To give you an example of that, Pastor Mary Beth and I one time were up in the city of Tiberias, Tiberia, in Israel. And uh, we were excavating in a salvage excavation because a huge hotel was being built there. And we had to clear it archaeologically before they could build the whole t hotel. And uh, we've discovered, wasn't from ancient, ancient, we discovered a crusader church. They didn't know the crusader church was there. We discovered this crusader church. And so uh, after I, I put it all on paper and uh, the, the plans, the, oh, the people who were building the hotel came to me and said, you made a mistake. That's not where it is. And I said, no, that is where it is. And I resurveyed it to make sure. I said, that's where it is. And they said, well, can you, can you just change the drawing? Can you put it, put it over here so we can build our hotel? And I said, no, I can't do that. That would have been a compromise. And uh, I was saved at that time. Now, when I was unsaved, if somebody had come to me, I probably would have said, how much is, how much is it worth to you? <laughs> but uh, once I'm saved, I'm not going to compromise. Said, no, that's where it is. Now, to this day, if you stay in that hotel, it's right on the Sea of Galilee. There's an archaeological park. They moved the hotel. There's an archaeological park there, and you can see the old Crusader church, which is still there. But one slight issue here is going to be major issues down the road. And that's the same thing with compromise. Once you start compromising, you continue to compromise. And this first compromise, the enemy's coming, is in a personal way. He's hungry. It's a personal compromise. It is not some big major compromise. Once we begin to compromise personally, that's when the door is opened and the enemy will try to get us to compromise more and more. And at one point, we won't be able to stop ourselves, but we compromise in every area of life. Think about today. What area? We should be reading the Word of God each and every day. We should be taking some time to pray. Remember, I've asked you from January to be praying 15 minutes in the Holy Spirit every day. Do you know how many times I'm up here on Thursday night? Because Thursday night we always have that 15-minute prayer time. And, and I get this thought, well, maybe today we'll pray for 12 minutes. Because I watch it on my phone. Maybe today let's do 12 minutes because you really, like Thursday. Thursday, the air conditioner was just fixed. It was 84 degrees in here during service. And the first thought, let's just pray 10 minutes today. Well, that's five minutes more than some of your faith. Some of you wanted to leave right away. But, you know, that's compromise. If we compromise in our personal habits, our personal time with God, we are, it makes it so much easier to stop. And let me give you another compromise. And I don't want to, listen, anybody who has compromised immune system, I don't want you to risk because we have had an influx of COVID once again. But there are some people that are fine. And... They go out to the Walmart or to the store or to work or to jobs or to visit relatives, but still haven't come back to church since we shut down for one month in South Carolina. One month it was shut down and we've been open since May of 2020. Well, that's compromised because, yeah, I mean, the service, I love having the online church. Like I said, there's about nine states, maybe even 10 today with us. And if you're in Oregon or Massachusetts, Bob's in Massachusetts, or if you're in Florida, or uh, North Carolina, I'm not sure if Lauren's on with us in North Carolina, or if you're in Ohio, you folks in Ohio are with us every week. Anybody who's in, or Pennsylvania, all of those areas, yeah, you can't get here to church. 
So yes, please get online. But what I want you to do is open up your home and invite neighbors, friends, coworkers in and start something there. Put, put this service on the big screen. But those of you in the local area, try to make your way back into church. A good time would be the 21st on Thursday because we're going to have cake. We'll even celebrate your return. Come on in for some cake. But let me know ahead of time because I'm getting a small cake. And if you're coming, I may need to get a big cake. But we compromise. Um, Jesus answers, you know his answer. He answered and said, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. We live by the spoken word of God. We live by the spoken word of God. God spoke it, and then we speak it. We resist the tendency to compromise. It is so easy to compromise. It is so tempting to compromise. Nobody will know it. I'm sure people have even said that to you, but nobody will know. Nobody will know. Hasn't anybody ever come to you and tried to get you to do something that you know you shouldn't do, or you stopped doing when you got saved? And they said, but nobody's going to, it's just between you and I. No, it's not just between you and I, it's between you and I and the Lord. And I'm, I'm not sure what everybody up there sees, but all the angels in heaven, I don't know if they see it. Your relatives, I don't know. Is your mother-in-law going to say, I knew I couldn't trust you when you get to heaven? You know, <laughs> you know I don't know, but I'm surmising. But when we live by the word of God that comes from the mouth of God, there's no interpretation of that. How many people interpret the word? Have you ever heard this? Well, yeah, that's what the Lord Jesus said that, but it's not what he meant. All right, well, if he didn't mean that, why did he say that? And when he said that, how could he not mean that? That's like us. You used to, your parents, when, how many of you, when you were little, your parents would tell you to go to bed and you didn't think they really meant it until they were about to take the belt off? That was my, in my home, that was what it was. Uh, don't make me get the belt. Now, they never hit us with the belt. It was the threat of the belt. And you'd push it. You didn't think they really meant it yet. But when you, once you reach for the buckle, that's when you ran. That's when you went. Well, we mean what we say. God means what he says. If he says, I'm the Lord thy God, thy healer, he means it. If he says, ask and you will receive that your joy may be made full, he means it. Whatsoever you ask in my name, you'll receive. You'll, he means it. We must not compromise the word of God through interpretation. Also, we believe it, which means we stand upon it. Rather than compromise by doing something, saying something, being something that we know is wrong, stand. And having done all, continue to stand. Don't compromise personally in any area. Now, the second, we see the devil takes him up to the holy city, sets him on a pinnacle of the temple, and says, if you be the Son of God, and, and we're not talking about sin today. I know this is generally temptation and sin, and it, it always proceeds by if. But I'm not going to be touching that today. Uh, if you be the Son of God, cast yourself down. It is written, he shall have his angels... Uh, give char he gives his angels charge over you concerning you. They are going to catch you up in their hands so that you don't dash your foot against a stone. That is a compromise involving our faith. A compromise involving our faith. People will say that what you believe, it's kind of outdated. What you believe is kind of outdated. You know, I, we, we, uh, we one time had a, a, somebody go into a church and say, oh, this is a great church. It's a great church. They have this great um, singles group or, you know, and uh, then we come to find out what's great about it is they would it had a singles group with wine and beer. And, and uh, yeah, that, okay. That may be fine for a singles group in the world, but not for a singles group in the church. Now you might say, well, but Jesus drank wine. Yeah, Jesus drank wine. Now, if you want to drink wine like that, get a bottle of wine, get four bottles of water, mix it together. Because the wine was only used to purify the water. If you remember Jesus at the wedding feast, what were all those pots of water doing there? That was to mix with the wine because you could not drink the water. And the wine was always mixed. I believe it was three parts water to one part wine. So that is pretty watered down. Talk about light beer. That's pretty light wine if you're going to water that down. So no, they weren't drinking to get drunk. They were drinking because it's the Middle East. It's hot. And you need to drink and you couldn't trust the water. I'm testimony to that. You all know those stories, I tell you, when I live with the Bedouin in their tents for four months. How when I would drink their water, I sometimes get sick before I got saved. 
And then after I got saved, I got sick anyway, but got healed. Praise the Lord. That, that's the difference. You know, everybody gets sick, but it's the believer who gets healed. Amen? Well, some of you are going to get healed. So compromise always involves the word if. That's, that's where the sin comes in. Compromise always involves the word if. If you really, if you really care about me, if you really care about me, if you really love me, girls, if you really love me before you're married, if you really love me, if you really love me, you don't really love me, show me, prove me, prove to me you really love me. Compromise. Compromising what you believe. Compromising for what you stand. We stand for the word. We stand. Um, I, don't, I don't want to go political. You know, if the God's word is our foundation, it's not outdated. How many of you ever owned an old house? A house like 100, 200 years? You know, by the way, our, when we used to go to um, Switzerland and Italy and Slovenia with our missionary who lived there, his house was built in 1460. Had the date on it, 1460. Uh, that's before Columbus came here, you know, 1492. It's still standing. The house is still on the same foundation. It doesn't matter how old the word of God is, it's a solid foundation. If you build your house by being a doer of the word, the storms of life are not going to knock you off your foundation. That house has stood since 1460. It is not knocked off its foundation. We were talking to um, uh, Zane. Zane's not here today. Oh, there you are. I was looking over here. You usually sit over there. I'm, I'm off. So Melissa, Melissa was telling me that Zane, their son, is going to go to York, England for his master's degree and possibly PhD. And I lived in York for about four months excavating there. And I said, oh, I love York. There's a street in York. The houses are from the 1300s. They haven't changed the foundation. It's from the 1300s. And you can walk down that street and see buildings from the 1300s. Our foundation may be 2,000 years old, and even older if we consider the Mosaic word. But it's a sure foundation. We do not need to compromise. Now, compromise, by the way, interesting. If you look up the definition of compromise, it means made vulnerable. Compromising makes us vulnerable. Compromising the word of God makes us vulnerable to sin. Compromising the word of God makes us vulnerable to becoming weak and defective. It also means impaired. Impaired. We don't want to be impaired spiritually. We need to be sharp spiritually. God has called us into the army of God, given us weapons of warfare. So we cannot be impaired. I believe, has anybody here ever been in the Air Force? I think, Pastor Jeff, you were in the Air Force, right? Um, in the Air Force, correct me if I'm wrong, but we used to have an air base here, and we used to have a bunch of people from the air base in church a long time ago. Now you all know it is, what's it called down there? Market Common. I still call it the old air base. I'm sorry. It's the back gate of the air base. And uh, anyway, they told me that if you wore glasses, you could not be a pilot. Or if you couldn't even if contact lenses, you can't be a pilot. That would be because it'd be impaired. If they did some kind of a maneuver and their lenses popped out, they couldn't see. That would be a problem. We cannot be impaired with our spiritual vision, our spiritual sight cannot be impaired in any way. We must see clearly, and God's word clarifies our view. Also, it means, um, it means weakened to compromise. If you have a compromised foundation, that's a weakened foundation. It means weakened. It means damaged. It means flawed. This is compromise. Made vulnerable, impaired, diminished in function. If we are compromised, we're diminished in function. Do you realize we all have a function in the body of Christ? We have a function in the kingdom of God. Compromise diminishes us in function. We are not able to be who God's called us to be, created us to be, anointed us to be. Unable to fulfill our role in the kingdom of God. We're living stones, Peter said. Unable to be that living stone, building the wall, the house of God. We have the divine nature of God, but we're not using it properly because we're flawed. So all of that comes from compromise. Let's move on to the next one. Um, and in, uh, with this, I have a lot of fans up here, so I got, hopefully I have a lot of fans out there too. 
Again, the devil takes him up into an exceeding high mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and says, all these things will I give you if you will fall down and worship me. That is a compromise of culture. Compromise of culture. Isn't our culture kind of say you should sell out to gain? If you sell out, you're going to gain. If you just be like everybody else. So the word of God, Barbara also mentioned that this morning. Romans chapter 12, verse 2, be not conform that's be not compromised be not it doesn't mean that I'm, I'm saying it be not conformed to this world but be transformed we looked at that at the power up on Friday I believe transform transform the word is metamorpho in the Greek transformed like a caterpillar transforms into a butterfly it's a total complete transformation completely different there is no resemblance between a butterfly and a caterpillar they're like two different species but they're not that is how radical the transformation is to be with us that word is also used on the Mount of Transfiguration when it says Jesus was transfigured. That's the same word. So what he's saying is that it is not just we try to be good, we work at being good, we pattern our lives, and we break our bad habits. Yes, that's all part of it, but it's a spiritual transformation where we have the glory of God. Jesus became glistening with the glory of God, and it opened up revelation. They saw Moses, and they saw Elijah, the law, and the prophets. So this transformation opens the windows of heaven to us that we can see things others can't see, know things others don't know, be who others cannot be, because God's called us to be those people in the kingdom of God. Hearing things from the Spirit. Our spiritual ears opened in that transformation, and we can hear the voice of the Lord. Have you heard the voice of the Lord recently? Have you heard him instruct you, guide you, and speak to you? Have you heard revelation in the word of God? As we meditate, what was, what was Joshua told? Joshua was about to take over for Moses. And he's like, Moses were pretty big shoes to fill. They had followed him for 40 years. They needed water, strike the rock, gives water. You know, he had manna coming from heaven every day except Saturday. They, he lifts his arms in worship, and they beat and defeat, defeat Amalek. He stretches his hands over the sea, and it parts. I mean, how can you follow that act? Joshua must have felt insecure. He must have felt not incompetent, but not able to be another Moses. And he wasn't called to be another Moses. But what advice did God give him? The Lord said in Joshua 1.8, You shall meditate in the word of God day and night. Keep it before your eyes. Keep it in your heart. Keep it on your lips that you may know. That you may know. That you may understand. Medi through meditating in the word of God. Then you will make your way successful. Then. Then you will prosper. Now, of course, it's my... Uh, I, I didn't quote it verse for verse. But that's the gist of it. And what God is saying is if we meditate in the word of God, we're going to know him better. And meditation is not something to fear because it's from Eastern religions. Meditation is from the word of God, the Bible. That word meditation means meditation. It means, but we don't, we don't meditate, on, meditate on some kind of a karma or whatever they meditate on. We meditate on the word of God. We hide it in our hearts. We say it to ourselves. We think about it. We speak it out loud. And what happens is God gives us revelation. We, we hear his voice. Meditating in the word of God is one of the easiest ways to hear the voice of the Lord. Because you hear your voice saying it, and when he gives you a revelation, you hear his voice. And the more you hear his voice, the more you get to know his voice. If you didn't know me, and I called you up on the telephone, I would have to say, hey, this is Pastor Frank. And then you'd know who it is. But if I called you every day, after a while, I'd just say, hey, or hi, for those in the north. And... You'd know who I am. You'd know right away who I was. You'd recognize my voice. The same with the Lord. If we hear his voice on a regular basis, we recognize his voice. And when we recognize his voice, we move, we operate, we believe, we trust, we do. We're doers of the word of God. Now here in this compromise, it involved an exchange. An exchange of his honor and of his faith for an untested, empty promise. That's, that's the bottom line. It was an exchange. And that is the exchange that's offered to us every single day. Worship this, not this. Worship this. The world worships various people, whether they're in entertainment industry, sports, whatever it is, they worship. Some worship political figures. It's always a compromise to worship a person rather than the Lord. 
and there's empty promises. You know, I, I, you may be the, the kind who wants to get autographs and things. I personally, I don't like to wear clothes with anybody else's name on it unless they pay me. That's my theory. Why would I wear something that says Tommy unless he's paying me every time I wear it? I'm advertising his name. That doesn't make sense. I, I'm sure he doesn't go to an advertising company and cuts a commercial for free. I'm sure the commercial doesn't say, hey, we just want to, we want to, we want to spend all our time shooting a commercial for you, editing it, and airing it on television or in the movies because we like your name. I'm sure. Anyway, that's my, that's my thing. <laughs> I just don't like to wear labels. But we don't want to compromise by wearing the label of the world. Be not conformed. There was such pressure to conform. Um, my kids, you know, work in various industries around the community. And last month was Pride Month. And they were given T-shirts to wear. And they wouldn't wear them. And the manager said, why, why, don't you wear, why aren't you wearing the T-shirt? And their theory was, if we had a T-shirt about Jesus, would we be allowed to wear it? No, they wouldn't be allowed to wear it. And, but, and they, they, didn't, they didn't get in the face of the manager and they didn't insult anybody because they, they really liked the people they work with, even though a lot of them are of worldly. And we continue to love them because we love them. And there's one, one in particular who just, she's a lesbian, but she just, when I, I stop in sometimes, when I pick them up or I go in for a drink of coffee, They don't work in bars. It's a coffee shop, okay? And um, this one just really likes to hear what I have to say and says to her, to, to one of my, my kids, you know, I just, there's something special. I just like to hear. It. It's the spirit of God. We can't, we can't oppose. We need to love, but we do not compromise what we believe. It's a fine line that we walk. Jesus was able to walk that line. He loved sinners. He, you know, and I'm going to say this again because I, I, I got this revelation maybe six or eight months ago. Jesus did not talk about sin as much as most modern preachers do. Think about this. You find the scriptures where he was down on people for sin. What did he say? Go and sin no more. He said that. Son, your sins are forgiven. He said that. What was the number one thing he was always on their case about? Lack of faith. How long will I suffer you? How long do I have to put up with you? Oh, ye of little faith. Never have I seen such faith. No, not in all of Israel. He was always on them for lack of faith. The stronger our faith, the less we'll compromise. Faith is a bastion against compromise. I don't mean, well, what faith are you? That kind of faith. I mean, mountain moving faith. If you believe in your heart that those things you say shall come to pass, you shall say to this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in your heart and you will have what you say. That's how cancer left my body 16 years ago through prayer, because the following verse, Jesus says, therefore, when you pray, believe you receive those things you ask for and you shall have them. And the doctors had pretty much given up on me. But three days later, I was cancer free. Because I heard the voice of the Lord say, you shall live and not die and declare the wonderful works of God. For I sent my word and healed you and delivered you from all destruction. Now, when you hear the voice of the Lord say something like that, and you hear the doctor say, well, there's not much we can do for you. You can't get it all out. Which one are you going to stick with? Which one are you going to hold fast to? And which one are you going to believe? If you hold fast the word of God, you'll never be disappointed. You'll experience breakthrough. You'll experience a greater portion of resurrection life. You'll have answered prayer. You'll walk by faith. You will see things that others don't see. As I mentioned earlier, hear things others don't hear because that's the voice of the Lord. Compromise, as in what I just said, is a untested, empty promise. It may happen, it may not happen. God's word is a sure thing. Why would you invest your life in an untested, empty promise when you can have the real thing, the sure thing, one that always produces, one that always works? It's living seed. It's a living word. It grows. It works. God's word works. Hold fast the confession of your faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. We're told in Hebrews, don't compromise. 
Compromise starts right here. The same place temptation starts. It doesn't start here. If you're going to compromise, it takes a while for it to get from here to here. But the stronger you are here, the less you'll compromise here. Don't even consider the compromise. You see, when you're considering it, it's not sin. You're considering it. Don't act on it. When you act on it, it becomes sin. When it moves from here to here, it becomes sin. Hold fast to confession of your faith without wavering. He is faithful that promised. Without wavering. Abraham neither stumbled nor staggered at the promise of God, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. When you get that tendency, that temptation to compromise, stop right then and there. Give glory to God. Begin to thank him that his word is, sure, is a sure thing. That his word never fails. He's even said, everything is going to pass away. Praise God, this culture is going to pass away. I, I can say amen to that. I mean, there's so many crazy things going on. It's going to pass away. His word will never pass away. Even in our lifetime, all kinds of things come and go. What today is accepted 20 years ago was considered uh, aberrant behavior by psychiatrists, psychologists, and then they changed because they were under pressure. And so they changed. Doesn't mean it's right. And doesn't mean it's, it, it's, it's psychologically sound behavior. But they've had to change and it's been universally accepted. God's word never changes. God's word remains forever. So if you want something solid, if you want something sure, if you want something that never changes, go with the word of God. Not an untested promise. And each and every time, when Jesus defeated that temptation to sin, that temptation to compromise, he did it by the word of God. He spoke the word of God. Get used to speaking the word of God. Peter compromised, but what made the change in him? Because the same man who in the dark of night refused three times to acknowledge he knew Jesus, later on in broad daylight would stand in the temple preaching under threat of arrest, under threat of punishment, would stand there and preach. And once he was arrested and set free from prison, prison went right back to the temple area, preaching in broad daylight. Because he was filled with the Spirit of God and the resurrection life of Jesus. Those are our weapons against compromise in Jesus' name.